everybody. Happy Thursday. And when it's Thursdays, for those of you who are new, that means I'm on Twitter. If you haven't found me on Twitter, it's at Katie Morton. So you should just go and follow me. It's as easy as that. And then use the hashtag KatieFAQ and you ask your questions. And I sort them and I find them. And I have three today, as well as a journal topic and a shout out. So you want to stay tuned for that. And I'll try to make it quick because I know some of you have told me the videos can be really long and it's hard for you to um, watch them all the way through in one sitting. So let's get this going. So the first question says, hashtag Katie FAQ, is it possible to break the habit of black and white thinking or is my thought process stuck like this for good? Now I did a video on black and white thinking, um, probably six or eight months ago. I'm not sure. I kind of lose track, but I did a video on it and, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about it because many of us feel like this is just the way our life is. And we worry about any process that we're having or any struggle we're having in our life. And we think, is it going to be like this forever? Like, oh, I can't tolerate it. And I want to remind all of you, the main reason that I became a therapist and the reason that I continue to be a therapist is because there's this amazing thing called a human brain that's very adaptable and changeable and workable. And when we struggle with something, being aware of it and trying different things, can really make a huge difference. It can help us change the way that we think. It can choose the way, change the way that we cope with things that happen to us. It can change the way we are in our relationships. It, it can do a lot of great things. And that's what makes therapy so great. And that's why working on ourselves, I mean, it's a lifelong process, right? It's not perfection, it's a process. And so that's just the first thing I wanna remind all of you because regardless of whether it's black and white thinking or it's your anxiety or depression, Working on it is what gets us out of it. Just being upset about it and doing nothing is what makes it worse, right? So when it comes to black and white thinking, no, it's not something that you're stuck with for the rest of your life. It may be something that when you're really, really stressed out, you find your brain going back to. But the way that we get it out of this rut, I'll call it a rut, um, is by being aware of it. That I know it sounds really silly and simple, but it's actually really difficult. And noticing when you think to yourself, or you might even say out loud, like, oh, this isn't quite perfect. It's garbage. I'm throwing it out. Or, damn it, I messed up once. This is over. I'm back. My recovery is back to square one. And we forget all of the work we've done, all of the things that we've worked on in our life, or even, let's say it's even an art project, and it's one thing that's off, but sometimes those little, little tiny mistakes turn out to be the most beautiful part of the piece. And I agree. I think that that also is how it is with humans and the way that we are. Those tiny little oopsies mistakes or things that are bad about us or what make us unique, what make us wonderful. And it's not all or nothing. Recovery is a process. It's not perfection. Life is a process. It's not perfection. So the more we can become aware of it, then the more able we are to think differently or to change that tune. So our brain is so used to saying, oh, well, this didn't work. No, it's all done. It's over. Or this didn't, um, oh, this shirt, it just doesn't quite fit just the way I'd anticipated. And I can't wear it today. I got to change. You change like 5,000 times. And a lot of it can pull into our OCD and our perfectionistic tendencies. Um, but once we notice, then we can say, you know what? I'm going to walk away from it today. I'm going to leave it or I'm going to wear that or I'm going to put that painting up anyways. Or, you know what? I worked a lot on my recovery and this little slip up doesn't mean the end of the world. And we start to talk back and change what our brain is telling us. Now, it takes time. It takes practice, just like anything else. We didn't get the way we are automatically. We may not remember a time when we didn't, but it's been happening for a long time time. Maybe even our whole lives, we've slowly been thinking more negatively, more black and white thinking. Um, so I would become aware and I would start switching that tune, start changing the way you think and start talking back to it a little bit. Even if you don't believe it at first, it can help to just do it. So you're not stuck. Don't worry. Question number two. Hey, Katie, I'm forcing my mom into treatment today when she comes home. Any advice? Her 17 year old daughter is telling her this. I thought this was really interesting. Um, I've had clients at treatment centers, not in the outpatient because I wouldn't take them, but that were forced by family, almost through intervention or something like that. Um, and it is really terrible. First of all, I applaud you for, for having the, the guts and the love for her and the care to speak up and to tell her that she needs help. I want to make you aware of the fact that it may not go well at all. I know that sounds horrible and like dreary and down and dark and I don't do that kind of stuff, but 
interventions and forcing people into treatment usually doesn't end very well. Um, people have to want to get better. We know that. But sometimes we can't wait for them to get better, especially if it's a parent and we're being neglected, we feel abused. It could be any number of things that are happening. Um, then we have to take care of ourselves, right? We have to put ourselves first anyways. We can't take care of others if we don't take care of ourselves. And by kind of taking care of her, you're in a way taking care of yourself. Um, I would encourage you to, to limit the amount of blaming terms that you use, like you make me or you, you know, you did this to me. I would try to turn it kind of on its ear and to her say, these are things I worry about you and I love you because of this, this, and I miss these things about you. Something that can help us sometimes writing a letter first. Um, when we are, when someone in our life is hurting so much and we really need them to get help and it's actually hurting us as a result, it helps to tell them all the reasons that you love them, all the things you want them to be around for, and kind of like motivating them to get in recovery or to work on themselves and talk about how hard it has been for them not to be around. You know, like you could say, let's say it was a, you know, it's your mother so and you're 17. So you could say, you know, mom, I would love for you to be a part of my life and when I meet the man of my dreams or the woman of my dreams or when I go to college, you can start talking about little milestones you want her to be there for and you can say, you know, but things going the way they are, I just don't see that happening and that really hurts me. So instead of blaming and yelling, I find that to be the least effective, I would try to tell her all the reasons you love her and all the reasons why she may want to get better, okay? I hope that goes well and I'm so sorry that you have to go through this. Okay, question number three. Hey Katie, can I go to school with a mental illness? And then there's a longer note. She says, I would love to go back to school, but I literally can't shut my brain off. I tried college right after high school, but it ended up dropping out. I have maladaptive daydreaming and it's so hard for me to focus on reality for more than a few minutes. My therapist told me if I'm unable to study and have no energy to put into the work due to my depression, then I shouldn't be in school. But I'm stuck in life right now and I don't know what to do. I have a career path in mind, but I'm not sure how and when I should go back and make it happen. What do you think I should do? Thanks, Katie. It can be really hard and I have to partially agree with your therapist in, in the fact that I don't think you should go back to school full time. I do this with a lot of my clients. If you're struggling to focus, if your depression is completely debilitating at times and the maladaptive daydreaming makes it really hard for you to focus during school or during studying or maybe during a test when it's stressful, I would encourage you to start with one class. The reason that I say that and I know it doesn't give you enough to do where you feel like you're kind of stuck in life, but you are moving in the right direction. So. I think one class is a great way to start because of the fact that we can practice and we have time to come back. So, okay, let's say we're studying and we just can't focus. It's only one class. We don't have multiple things to study after that. We can focus on the one. We can see how it goes. And from there, plan for, you know, subsequent semesters or quarters or however the school system you're at works. But I would start with just one class and then that would give you kind of a practice round as well as help you learn tools you may need when you um, go into it full time, hopefully in the future. Um, something that can also help during testing season, please, please, please have your doctor or your therapist write you a note, um, take it to the student services office so you can get more time on your exams. They actually allow more time for people with ADD or ADHD um, or with other mental health issues where it's really hard for you to focus for long periods of time and that might help you um, get through it. So I think you totally can go back to school. We just have to take it slow and see how it goes, okay? Journal topic today. Now this is something that I've been doing and this is just something that popped in my mind actually yesterday. Um, we all have shitty days, right? There are days when I'm just grouchy and I don't know why and nothing really particular has happened but when people like cut in front of me or swerve over without a blinker, I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Bah, 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 bah. And I'm angry and I'm frustrated and there's no real reason and I'm lashing out at people. They don't know I am because I'm in the comfort of my own vehicle but I don't really like feeling that way. And I'm sure none of you like feeling that way either. Um, so something that I've been doing, because I live in a city, and this might be something that you may not be able to do as much unless you live in a city, but if you work in a building with people, it may work that way too. So as long as I'm driving, as I'm walking into the building, as I'm in the parking garage, all that stuff, as I run into other people, I compliment them in my mind. I see somebody on the sidewalk, go, oh, that's a cute dress. She looks really nice today. Wow, he is working really hard. He did a nice job painting that or cleaning that or whatever. Compliment people in your mind. It sounds really ridiculous and kind of silly, but it really helps shift your mood. So if you're having one of those negative days, compliment everyone you see. Wow, they're really trying hard. Wow, they are really, you know, 
parking that car well, it can be as silly as that, but it really helps shift our mind from negatively focused to positively focused. So I hope you like that. And shout out to Jess May because she is in the hospital and she's been having a really, really hard time um, and just a lot of medical issues and I'm really worried about her. So shout out to Jess. We're thinking of you, we love you, and we hope you have a speedy recovery. I love you all. I'll see you on Friday. Tomorrow is Friday. And I'll be on Facebook, so ask your questions there. I'll see you then. Bye!